Hi, I'm Dr. Melissa Walton Shirley. We're here at the European Society of Cardiology meeting in 2011 in beautiful Paris, France. And I have with me today Dr. Marielle Jessup. She's from the University of Pennsylvania and a heart failure specialist that is known all over the world for her ability to put things in a very concise manner and to be able to talk all around the subject. Marielle, I really appreciate your being with me here today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, I have two or three topics I'd like to do, and I want to just briefly talk a little about Avabradine. I, I remember the very first trial I saw with this uh, compound, I was just a little bit disappointed because I thought it was going to knock it out of the park, but it seems that maybe we hadn't studied the right subset of patients. This is a very odd compound. It's a specific sinus node inhibitor. It doesn't impact AV nodal conduction. And in the beautiful trial, we had a decrease in coronary events with patients with coronary disease and in patients that had heart rates greater than 70 beats per minute. And then now we have the SHIFT trial, which is uh, demonstrated an 18% reduction in death and heart failure hospitalization. So now that we've had this meeting and we've seen this subset of patients that have had improved quality of life indicators, I'd like to know where you will use this medication and how you look forward to utilizing it. Well, so of course the SHIFT trial was the big news at last year's ESC meeting and the comments after the major presentation were maybe we can get heart rate down by just using bigger doses of beta blockers. And so I think in particular in the United States where we don't have evabradine, um, it, it, it was not a story. I really feel that this year we've been compelled to go back and look at the data. What we saw today uh, during this meeting is, is in two particular outcomes were important. In those groups of patients that had their heart rate decreased, they had better remodeling and they had better quality of life. And what I heard Carl Svedberg say, which I think is really, it's important to hear what, what he has to say. He said, I think this drug is better than using more beta blockers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an issue that we're going to have to explore and maybe this drug has capabilities that the, the most amount of beta blockers won't give us. And I, I do think it deserves a second look, particularly of those of us in America that don't have the drug yet. Sure, and I wondered about most of the comparators with this compound are with atenolol. And there was some big difference between the amount of fatigue that patients experienced with atenolol versus evabradine. But is it really fair to compare it to atenolol, which is fairly fatiguing? I mean, we have right. other and better beta blockers. What do you think about that? Well, of course, in, in heart failure, atenolol isn't even an evidence-based drug. So that won't be uh, important for us to understand what will be important. And the SHIFT trial did use more uh, evidence-based drugs. So. What, what the side effect potential, whether the adherence to these drugs. In the end, what we'll have to understand is it better to lip, use a smaller dose of evidence-based beta blocker and of Aberdeen, will that be better tolerated and get as good, if not better, effect that we've seen with beta blockers for so many rear, years now? I think these are going to be really important issues for us to explore. And you know, it's kind of like a new car or a new dress or what have you. These drugs are just great and fascinating and wonderful, these new compounds coming down the pike. But we apparently can't even get the basics covered. You know, we have right. things like, uh, let's talk about the Emphasis HF trial, for instance, a plerinone. Apparently, we're not using much of plerinone, and we really need to be doing that. So um, talk to me a little bit about how you feel that we can get this drug implemented into the patients that really need it. Well, I think there was a, an important clinical trial update at this meeting of the Emphasis HF that looked at five important subsets of patients. Those were patients with a history of diabetes, the elderly, patients with blood pressure below 123 millimeters of mercury, with a GFRs below, I think, 40. And all of those subsets had the same benefit in mortality and in hospitalizations that they saw in the overall trial. So the two concerns with drugs like eplerinone and uh, uh, other uh, aldosterone antagonists has been that it may be in a large population there's a big benefit, but that there's important subgroups that it's too dangerous to use. That wasn't seen in this clinical trial update, and I think it compels us to really say what is it that's preventing us from using these drugs in a wider selection of patients. 
part of it is probably systems these drugs when they get started you have to monitor the patients carefully have to make sure you get their blood work back and that is a systems approach that each physician has to solve in their own practice now can we extrapolate this information to spironolactone or do you do that in your practice I think I do extrapolate it I think there was a good reason in the United States to use spironolactone rather than plerinone because of cost but a plerinone is now generic and so just because of tolerability I um, use a, a plerinone really as a first-line drug now and just from a personal subjective perspective is there a potassium level that's sort of a cutoff for you that you won't implement this uh, medication well that's a great question uh, I hesitate in somebody that's on good doses of ACE inhibitors or ARB um, if their potassium is already over 4.5 in particular if it's in the setting of renal dysfunction I still may want to try uh, aldosterone antagonists, but I, I'm particularly careful that we follow up on those patients carefully. And then the second question is, how soon do you follow up with a marginal potassium, something that's just a little bit more elevated than you're comfortable with? How soon do you get your basic panel? I do it within three to five days, okay. and I make sure their potassium is stopped so in case they're on it. But I'm pretty vigilant about these patients. These are the people you worry about. And you recommend a lower potassium diet, I guess, too, as well. For well, you make patients. sure, I mean, especially in the summer, uh, people are eating lots of tomatoes and other things with lots of uh, potassium. So you do want to review that with patients that you're worried about. Sure. And then you were talking with me earlier about the gender differences with congestive heart failure research. I thought that was fascinating. Can you tell me a little more about well, that? It was really interesting. There was quite a lot at this meeting focusing on gender response, including the elderly woman with aortic stenosis and how women fare with TAVI versus not. But in particular, what's been known for a long time is, is that HEFPEF, the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, is a disease of women and trying to understand the pathophysiologic basis of that. In fact, so much of our research in heart failure and cardiovascular response to hypertension has involved male young mice. And there were several presentations that I heard that looked at the comparison between young male mice and old male mice and young and old female mice. So even some of our pathophysiologic underpinnings may have to be changed and maybe we have to start doing gender specific basic research as well. Sure, I mean that underscores the fact that we don't have a lot of women in these large heart failure trials and so what do you suggest for trying to get more patients uh, that are female to enroll? It's really hard to understand why women don't go into trials. Part of it is is that women, especially in heart failure, are older and um, they don't really have people necessarily that are willing to drive them back and forth and come to the trials. They don't come to cardiologists as much as men do. And it's still, despite all our efforts to, to get women to understand that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women, women still worry about other things. They worry about their families first, and then they worry about breast cancer which is an important enemy, but cardiovascular disease is the number one. I could not agree more, and I thank you very much for joining me again today. And thank you as well for joining us here for the Cardiology Show European Society of Cardiology Meeting 2011. Have a great day.